Good morning, everybody. Um, we are excited to be here to talk about something that um, is happening all around us, the platformization of the everyday. Uh, we're just waiting to have one more speaker join us, and we will get started in a couple of minutes. So just give us a couple of minutes. So good morning again. On behalf of the Dynamic Coalition for Platform Responsibility and IT for Change, I welcome all of you to this uh, important session on what's now known as the gig economy or the sharing economy of the platform economy. It has many names, and when we use these terms, I don't think all of us mean the same thing. But we certainly know that our lives have been platformized. I'm feeling extraordinarily powerful today because I've got this hammer and this thing. I certainly am not going to use it, but this is the power of the UN. Uh, what I will do is get started um, by laying out the issues and why we have come to this particular discussion, particular workshop, uh, and then um, introduce the speakers that we have for you, and then we open it up for discussion. So we'll take perhaps the initial half an hour to set the stage and then have an hour for discussion so that it's interactive. Um, so the first slide, please. The reason why we're here uh, in terms of looking deeper at issues of pl platformization is because platforms are not just um, you know, mere bridges or intermediaries, but they are to the network age 
or the information society what the factory has been to the industrial revolution. So in that sense, um, they are very, uh, they are constitutive of uh, where we are and what society is. Uh, today, platforms have become the principal site of all economic activity around which everything else is organized. So although uh, the internet economy or the platform economy is a small part of the economy, uh, increasingly its power to control or its, uh, the levers that control the rest of the economy are with the platform companies. So in that sense, platform companies wield a lot of power. Uh, an example would be uh, Alibaba's new cloud business and they're calling it their new retail strategy and they're just like Amazon, they're going to offer you end-to-end -end services from organizing your inventory to smart uh, uh, production management to logistics management and all of this is going to be organized uh, in a way that um, those who sell their wares on Alibaba are able to avail of uh, uh, these uh, um, services. Next. Yeah. So in a certain sense, um, this kind of economic restructuring and reorganization, we believe, is also spilling over to the rest of society. And so it's not just uh, the economy that's getting reorganized, but actually society as well. Uh, what we also notice is that the platform economy is almost parasitic. Uh, one excellent example in this regard is uh, the imminent takeover uh, by Bayer of Monsanto. The idea being that if you have uh, pharmaceutical data with you and you're going to get take over a company and there's going to be a merger of a company that has control over seeds and soil data, then you can imagine how the entire uh, agriculture input markets can uh, be controlled. So uh, in that sense, platforms or platform, the platform economy extends over and annexes traditional areas of the economy as well. This leads to serious questions in terms of uh, distributional equity, not just um, at uh, a national level in terms of who is able to or who is uh, capable of participating in the platform economy, but also in terms of the global political economy questions uh, which come back. Uh, so to just give you an example, uh, in the case of India, seven companies on Fortune's unicorn list are in India, in, mostly in the e-commerce sector. And this is more than South Korea, Netherlands, and Canada combined. But if you actually look at it, this entire uh, economy is, uh, is uh, comprised of only 2.5% per of the national labor force. So largely, 80% uh, of India's uh, population is still engaged in agriculture. So what it's telling you is that there is a certain uh, distributional equity problem that's arising here. So we have certain um, examples for you, and uh, I'd like to uh, point your attention to the, the key questions that we need to address here through um, the regulation and governance of the digital economy, yes, but also the regulation and governance of many other traditional economies. I just read a news piece today that Uber in, in the European court has just uh, lost a case and uh, it's been held as a transport company. So what does it mean actually for regulating new sectors and what does it mean for regulating old sectors? And what do you do about certain sectors which are essentially subnational laws? So you're actually uh, having to contend with uh, a transportation sector which might be regulated completely by municipal laws. But if you have a company which comes in which is like Uber, then what do you actually do in terms of harmonizing laws between um, you know, a phenomenon that might be uh, uh, pan-national uh, and uh, regulatory environments which may be subnational. The second is how does the policy framework navigate the terrain in e-commerce, for example, with so many different players? So you actually, in the context of, let's say, Asia or Latin America, you have these big GAFA companies, you have big players, you also have regional unicorns. And um, then you have the traditional players who are the SMEs, you have trade unions, you have brick and mortar stores, and the entire supply chain which is getting reconfigured. So the policy environment in most of these countries in the global south has to play catch up and it's a very, very complex uh, kind of thing. And it's, it's not as if the phenomenon is waiting for you to catch up. Things are actually changing by the day. Then of course, the most important D word, the regulation of data. So you actually have platforms which are sites of contestation of data access, data use, and also data ownership, which is often forgotten. So while we talk about uh, rights 
um, of privacy of consumers, of citizens, oftentimes there is also, in the context of platforms, um, um, especially um, foreign companies that operate on national soil, a monopolistic abuse of data. So the, the Japanese regulator, for instance, has recently raised a question in terms of um, anti-competitive uh, you know, uh, practices for a more fair economy as to what's happening to the data that's being taken away by these uh, uh, global multinational companies. Uh, the question can actually be posed in reverse. So you can ask the question, what's the social value of data that platforms generate? So that is there a possibility by which international players can have a kind of um, uh, a national um, uh, a discipline, uh, illegal discipline, to share data with, let's say, local governments. You know, this, this makes most logical sense in things like the transport sector. Um, so who owns data and can local governments use it for larger communitarian purposes? Then you have the entire ambit of labor and consumer protection laws about which, you know, I think there's been enough that's said and enough that's written in terms of definitions, you know, who's an employer, who's a trader, who's an intermediary, who's an employee, and what happens to, you know, uh, traditional social contracts in terms of who's an informal worker, who's a formal worker, and what happens to social protection. And what's with countries who've not even datafied and digitalized, and how do they cope with uh, platform economy uh, regulation. I'd like to also point you to certain new areas because we are very familiar with, let's say, the, uh, the housing, uh, Airbnb, and the transportation sectors. But in the context of the Global South, there are certain other emerging uh, areas of the economy which really uh, require to be looked at. And one very important sector, uh, this is uh, rather insidious because it's not quite visible, but everybody, you know, who's a small player, a small retail sector person, everybody needs finance. So the way in which P2P lending has changed, you know, the microfinance uh, sector has changed, is uh, that now it's completely integrated with uh, global financial markets through platformized processes. So traditionally, they were governed by financial intermediary and anti-money laundering regulations. But now, increasingly, that's not adequate at all. So you, welcome, Luca. Sorry for the Not at all. I'm just setting the stage. So um, we now have to deal with questions of uh, investment assets, capital requirements. So FDI, essentially, you know, what, what would be the foreign direct investment? You know, what would be the proportions? And data management. So these are new sectors. And there is, for the Global South, another very, very significant concern around care work online. So just by going online, is it possible to redefine social perceptions of care, care work, you know, for, especially for women who've been performing care work in the care work economy? Again, uh, TripAdvisor, travel and tourism platforms, you know, uh, um, a, a researcher that we are working with currently is investigating how cultural performativity gets kind of crystallized through these platforms so that you're projecting uh, uh, sincere and highly rated male drivers, you know, if you, if you were to land in Bali in Indonesia, whereas you will have, you know, uh, houses which are decorated and, you know, women posing in front of these houses with floral decorations. And in terms of gender biases, how these online rating systems of uh, uh, tourism platforms are reinforcing traditional biases in the economy. Next. So we are excited to have with us uh, um, four speakers. One speaker is not present here, but his voice and his thoughts will be. So we'll start uh, with Mark Graham. And then um, uh, these names are not appearing in the order of how we will organize the presentations. What we'd like to do is lay the stage as to capture the issues and then move on to questions of uh, regulation, particularly from the standpoint of economic justice, equity, and inclusion and then go on to looking at, theoretically, if these things can be regulated for inclusion and equity, are they really uh, 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 being regulated in that way? You know, what is the state of play in global negotiations, trade negotiations, for instance? So where do we stand in terms of the textbook kind of possibilities for regulation, uh, which will take care of consumer and uh, citizen rights? And what is really the real politic uh, at play? So can we have Mark Graham's um, uh, video? Mark is a professor of internet geography at the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, many of you will be familiar with his work because he is a geographer who's been working on these issues.
Viviana. Thank you, Anita, and thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm from the South Center, an intergovernmental organization of developing countries. So what I'd briefly like to touch upon in just this opening um, comments will be um, to that we, we also need to look at um, the issue of discussing um, the impacts of the platform economy in the broader context of the trends we see, in particular with hyper-globalization, um, where there, there is the sense that we have greater connectivity, greater sharing, um, the role of private sector increasingly in partnership with public sector being seen as quite efficient, um, reducing obstacles to um, access to technologies, to knowledge, um, and that deregulation and self-regulation is an effective means for organizing our society. On the other hand, we see um, the growing trends around the world where we are reminded that um, our growing international community that we've wanted to build, particularly for the information society, has not advanced at the pace we'd like to see. We have huge inequalities. We see this recognized in the um, Sustainable Development Goals and the whole UN framework here in Geneva. Um, so within this context, we need to recognize we're far from this discourse that we have in parallel of the growing opportunities that technology offers us. So technology as a tool is neutral. 
it, this is not a call to say we should not be um, ramping up and trying to promote a more connectivity, access to internet and use of technologies, but we have to see these as these are tools that there is a political economy behind. And our goal has to try to continue to address these inequalities also in how our digital society is developing. So what do we see is a, a fundamental trend of transformation in social, political, and economic life. Social, we can see many platforms, no need to mention here, um, but that also implies that we see some community um, weakening uh, locally. We see many times, and this might lead us to, um, to, to analyze some trends of why there is a growing sense of perhaps skepticism even of our neighbors now and the trends in Im immigration um, fears because we've lost a sense of our local community one-to-one, -one, increasing pressures of being part of social networks but that then leave us um, at loss at even our neighbor relations. And in the economic sphere, clearly we have um, a model of economic organization that platforms are part of, but fundamentally, do we see a difference but what we have in our um, capitalist society? Um, perhaps no, and we see very few examples of some um, perhaps very small <coughs> platforms that are trying to offer different alternatives um, to, for example, foster more exchanges that are not based on, on, on the basic premises we see in the normal market. Um, so the way we access basic goods and services might have open opportunities, um, but then the interactions of how we see ourselves as individuals interacting with the markets um, perhaps is a broader question that we, I, I would say there we don't have a fundamental change. The hyper-globalization trend of um, leading us to the sense that we must access global markets. Now global market do we really have global market? And even if we have spaces where we can act, uh, trade goods internationally, um, our market, our, our daily local markets should remain something that we should cherish and we should try to see how um, even um, current platforms um, could either pose a risk or an opportunity to foster more local exchange. Now in the political sense, we clearly see that um, the rising role of private actors is a general trend that we see also in the platform economy, which leads us to the basic question of where is um, the responsibility for governments in aiding individuals make sure um, that they're able to participate and have equality, not just in the market, but as social actors. And here we're reminded of the right to development, um, which is recognized where all peoples are entitled to participate and contribute and enjoy development in which all rights and freedoms can be fully realized. So do we have full participation as individuals and communities? And um, is, do we have a, um, a new framework where we're seeing that the individual, the human person is at the center of these developments? And one question from the social perspective is we increasingly see that once we leave um, our digital platform economy um, focused on pe not on people but on data, then we're missing out on the opportunities not just of the economic exchange but of the social exchange. Also on the political side, we have then questions about accountability, questions raised clearly in many fora about what's the regulation framework. So do we allow um, then parties to self-regulate, how much government should intervene, um, and then how much are we uh, accountable to citizens, to whose citizens, when we don't know where um, some, some accountability lies uh, uh, legally. This is also putting into question our democratic um, um, constitutions, um, where if we continue on um, playing on, on, on our current uh, context, we increasingly find pressures from low and, and, and middle income um, parts of society um, asking for an increased voice. And this, if there's no outlet through the markets, they will find it politically. And we can, of course, discuss um, where we see these trends already. So, of course, we are discussing here um, specific aspects of platforms, and there's many, many, many of those. And for all these cases, um, um, we, can, we can point of how we, we um, we can describe what, what is the, these examples in particular um, with regards to how platforms play. I think an important specificity on platforms is the fact that we have, um, um, because of the, of the nature of platforms, the, the um, network effects that are creative um, means that we cannot have, when we talk about equal playing field, of thinking that we're just gonna have an enormous amount of entry players in terms of platforms. We won't. And it would not be realistic to say that we should try to be enabling many other players within platforms because this will not happen precisely because of the economics of platforms. So that's a reality to deal with. 
Um, and again, in terms of regulatory strategies, we will have to work with the private sector actors that are behind. And we know that these are very, very um, um, difficult for government to address. When we know the minimum valuation for a startup that is considered now successful, or the unicorn startups, are about one billion. And the platform economy is how much money behind each platform is there. Um, so this is not easy to replicate. So I would say, um, in our discussion, I would like to hear more about how do we um, address the issues of, of addressing uh, participation in this platform economy, but not necessarily that we focus on creating additional platforms, but actually how do we create parallels to those realizing that we might not be able to have many more champions from the ones we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Viviane, especially for, those, for the sobering reminder that it's hard to um, play king in, in the network age, because there are people who got there first, and they have the first mover advantage. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Luca now. He's just released his uh, book, which uh, I'd love to read. It's called Platform Regulation. Um, how to regulate, how do we regulate platforms, and how do platforms regulate us? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Actually, it's a collective book uh, we have released yesterday. It's the outcome, uh, this year outcome of the Dynamic Coalition on Platform Responsibility. So there are more than 18 authors that have drafted uh, quite impressive contributions on the roles uh, and responsibilities that uh, pl online platform are uh, uh, undertaking and have been uh, delegated by some governments that are let's say delegating some both regulatory and police functions to some uh, private entities whose uh, obvious main goal is not the protection of internet users of the maximization of the public uh, good but the maximization of private pro for profit and the implementation of the most uh, cost effective uh, measures so this is a quite uh, risky path to have a blunt delegation of this very important uh, regulatory and police functions to private entities, uh, but to make a link to the to the topic, the more general topic of, of this session, uh, I would like to take a, a step a step uh, backward. Actually, in 2012, uh, already with a colleague with Primavera de Filippi, uh, I, we drafted a, a, a paper that was called "Law of the Land versus Law of the of the Cloud," because at, the, at that time platforms were cloud serv services. Uh, now, we actually, the, the, the contribution we made with some other colleagues, with Nicolosi Gales and another colleague from the CTS in the, in the book, uh, is law of the land or law of the platform. Because uh, in the, the, the second part of the title is beware of the privatization of uh, cyber regulation and cyber police. Uh, because we, we have uh, observed a clear tendency towards the delegation of this functions to online platform for one simple reason. Platforms are transnational. Uh, you do not have transnational governments. You do not have transnational authority. If you have to rule a transnational space, it's much more efficient to use a proxy, a private platform that can define, and actually the basic observation is that platforms combine uh, a quasi-regulatory power, a quasi-judicial power, and the quasi-executive power altogether. Uh, I'm speaking about quasi-regulatory power because they de unilaterally define uh, what is what I call the law of the platform, which are the terms of service uh, to which everyone has to abide to if you want to utilize the platform. So you, it's a take it or leave it uh, standard contract, uh, the, pro the, the provisions of which are unilaterally defined by the platform provider. So you do not have any bargaining power. It's, yeah, it is juridically a, con a contract, but your bargaining power is zero because you, only, you can only accept the conditions that are unilaterally defined by another entity or leave it and you don't use the platform. So if you want to, let's say, use Facebook, you can, you can only accept the conditions that are not only defined by Facebook, but a another study we did last year on terms of service and human rights demonstrate that almost 40% of the, the platform we analyzed, they have also provisions stating that they can unilaterally modify the provisions and they are not obliged to inform the user. So you, you are uh, accepting conditions that can be modified at will by the other party and you will not be informed. So that is much more pervasive uh, than the law of the land because at least you know if the parliament is changing the law, you can call your representative and uh, you uh, will be informed, you will know it. 
the, plat the law of the platform is much more feudal uh, type of legislation. It's uh, like a, 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 the lord of the cyberspace that defines what rules you will have to abide to and you simply abide to. And what is even more pervasive is that they can all, these rules are also automatically implemented the either directly in the architecture of the platform, so you can only do, uh, you can only undertake the behavior that has been defined by the contractual rules, and even more, uh, more uh, tricky is the, the algorithmic implementation of the rules, because the algorithms, for instance, that tells you uh, which kind of information you will, you will receive in your timeline, they are not even, the criteria, they are not even specified in the terms of service. So this is a very opaque body of regulation. It's regulation, it's algorithmic regulation, but it is not even defined in, the, in terms of service. Uh, and the terms of service also define a very, uh, uh, opa not opaque, but very vague way how your data will be collected and by whom. 80% of the platform we analyzed in the other study uh, that we did last year, that by the way, is freely everything is freely available online. The, st the terms of service study, you can, if you just type tinyurl.com slash T-O-S-H-R, you will freely download it. The book we have presented yesterday, tinyurl.com slash platform regulations, you freely download it. And uh, as I was saying, the, 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 plat the, the, the data that are collected in 80% of the cases are shared with third parties, non-specified, to improve the service. So this actually it's something that really uh, challenges the basis of data protection because the base of the very core of data protection is that people express cons informed consent to the collection and processing of their data. This is the, the, the core of any data protection framework around the world. There are more than 110 and almost everyone adopts this informational self-determination system, meaning that the user has to be duly informed will take the choice, the choice will be simply clicking. Yes, I have read the conditions, as everyone has done here, without reading the contract, but the, when you click the condition, I accept the condition without reading the contract, it means that you accept that everything that is in the contract will be applied. Part of this is that your data that are the most valuable resource in the world, as everyone is saying since almost 10 years, will, they will be collected and processed by an entity according to what the entity says and shared with the partners that you will not know for reasons that sometimes you don't even know. So that is the reason why uh, I'm saying that this challenge is the basis of data protection. Because if you don't know who is going to use your data and how, how can you be infor informed of the reasons, the purposes for which your data will be collected? So you can, it's virtually impossible. Let's assume that you will read the conditions, which is something that 90% of, 99% of people do not do. Uh, and there is a study, an interesting study, by the way, also uh, by McDonald and Craner in 2009. They proved that you would need 76 days per year to read the conditions of your services. So I'm, I'm really not sure that no one here reads the conditions. But even if you read them, by the way, there is another study by the OECD about li literacy. And all in the most developed country, only 30% of the people have the literacy skills necessary to understand the text. So imagine which kind of literacy competence you would need to understand a, co a contract that has been drafted not to be understandable, and imagine how those people can understand it in developing countries less than 30%. Imagine in the developing world where all these wonderful services are used based on terms of service, how people can really understand what they are doing and what, how their data are collected. So uh, th coming back to the quasi and I'm finished with this uh, uh, juridical part of the of the the, the, the the platform's power. They can only take uh, they can also take unilateral decision on how the terms of service are implemented. So, for instance, let's say that you say that an abusive content has been posted, the content will be removed or your account will be uh, closed and, and blocked. And you may sometimes in 80% of platforms say that you will not even be notified if your account is, uh, is uh, closed. So imagine how could you have a, uh, a way of redress if you don't even know that your account has been suppressed and why. So this makes it virtually impossible for a user to have uh, a, 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 to seek redress. And sorry, if I take just one last 30 seconds to say only one other thing. This is what is not only 
combination of three powers that are traditionally juridically separated. It's also, it's also what, I, what Susan Strange in the 80s called structural power. The way in, in which uh, you can define how people do things. It is not the way of imposing your will to other people, but it's a way to define how other people, natural person, juridical person, how can they in, can interact among themselves. If you want to utilize Facebook as a, as a commercial entity, you have to utilize Facebook API. You have to, utilize, to train your commercial uh, people to utilize Facebook uh, tools, and you will spend a lot of money to do, to, to do this or, and to train people in, in this way, and you will have to respect the, 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 the policies defined by, by Facebook and the standard, the API defined by Facebook, the social graph defined by Facebook if you want to collect data and know how people will use your service, your product in a sp specific area. So if you want to build an economy, you have to utilize a tool predefined by another entity. So if we want to, to allow people, in particularly in the developing world, to contribute to development of the digital future, the, which is the theme of this IGF, well, I think that we, would sh we should give them more efficient instrument to understand how, at least how they have been regulated by the others, and to construct a digital future by themselves, and not being culturally colonized and digitally colonized by others. So uh, thank you so much, Luca. And uh, I, I'd like to take a question that Viviana posed uh, and to pose it back to Sanya, who is from Third World Network, which is, do we really have global markets? And uh, we lived uh, in a time uh, for the past 20, 25 years um, in the global south having to believe that there is such a thing called free trade. And uh, now uh, we're being told that if only, you know, um, you can have a free data flows, for instance, um, you know, everyone can compete in the global market on an equal footing. And um, Luca just told us um, how the discursive power of uh, certain formulations, you know, certain ways by which truth is given to us makes us believe. Um, Sanya is just back from Buenos Aires where uh, she was on the front lines from civil society. Uh, uh, at the WTO. And so from your experiences of looking at the e-commerce uh, proposition uh, at MC11 and WTO, please uh, kindly tell us what you think about platforms. Uh, thank you. So I'm a trade lawyer with Third World Network here in Geneva, which is an NGO looking at the implications of international rules, such as the trade rules on various laws and policies. Um, and I'll try and go through some of the ways that the current and proposed trade rules can restrict the ability to regulate platforms in the ways that have been recommended by the other speakers. So the World Trade Organization, which is based here in Geneva, has 164 member countries. It is not multi-stakeholder. It's government to government negotiation only. Only governments are in the room. So the ministerial conference in Buenos Aires um, last week, I was there as civil society, but I couldn't get into the room. I was in the hotel lobby or I was five blocks away in the NGO center. Uh, and some of you might have known 64 NGOs, uh, 64 people from NGOs were discredited for the ministerial conference and the WTO uh, by the Argentine government and the WTO secretariat did not get them re-accredited even though they themselves had accredited them earlier. So um, the first thing I wanted to look at is the existing uh, trade rules at the WTO and free trade agreements that can restrict certain types of regulation of platforms. So uh, some platforms can be problematic. For example, in some cities, so many people are renting out their apartments and their houses to tourists on Airbnb that the locals cannot afford to buy or rent somewhere to live. So some cities have restricted Airbnb. They've said you cannot operate here or you can't have any new uh, housing or you have to cut down the amount of housing. But this is not allowed under the trade rules if you have liberalized that service sector at the WTO or in a free trade agreement because then you can't restrict the amount of companies providing these kinds of services or the amount of housing each one has. But the first thing is, what is the service sector that Airbnb is? Is it accommodation like hotels? or is it a computer-related service? We actually don't know. So we can't tell for the 164 countries at the WTO whether they've liberalized Airbnb or not. We actually don't know. The same for Uber. Is it a transport service or is it a computer-related service? So is London allowed to ban it or not, depending on whether the UK has liberalized that service sector or not? 
And of course, many countries are negotiating additional services liberalization now and free trade agreements and so on. So if you liberalize whichever sector Airbnb is, then you can't later restrict um, how much it operates in your regions or cities and so on. The second thing I wanted to talk about is the privacy of your data on platforms, as we've already heard. Um, let's look at, say, for example, your credit card details. If you are um, going online to buy things on Amazon.com or buy air tickets or whatever, you might want the website to use HTTPS to make sure your credit card details cannot be stolen. And some governments require this. They say you must have certain level of security for these kinds of credit card transactions to make sure your credit card details are not stolen. But the e-commerce proposals at the World Trade Organization restrict your ability to do this. Now, in the WTO, there is no mandate yet to negotiate e-commerce rules. The existing mandate is let us discuss the issue of e-commerce, figure out whether Airbnb is an accommodation service or a computer-related service, but not negotiate new rules. But at the ministerial conference of the WTO last week, 70 countries signed a statement saying, we want to negotiate e-commerce rules, and they are going to try and get those negotiations, say, next year. And one of the proposals that has already been made at the WTO by the uh, EU and other countries says that governments have to leave it to companies to decide how secure their things should be. And you can have an exception for one category of transactions. So you choose online banking, then you can't require online shopping to have HTTPS. And this uh, has even been more extreme in the EU-Mexico free trade agreement where the EU has said no exceptions. Governments must entirely allow it to companies to choose their level of security. They cannot interfere and require two-factor authentication for online banking or HTTPS. If all your credit card details are stolen, too bad. The EU doesn't care. Then uh, if we look at some of the other proposals in the WTO and other free trade agreements um, that can affect privacy, in the WTO there is a proposal by Japan for cross-border data flows at all times with no privacy exceptions and also no ability to require data to be stored locally, even if it's health data, financial data and so on. So if this is agreed to, this would mean that Facebook can transfer the data of EU citizens to any country in the world where it can be sold to banks who can deny you credit, can be sold to health insurance companies who charge you more because on Facebook you said I was just diagnosed with cancer. All this is okay under Japan's proposal at the WTO. And even if the existing WTO privacy exception applied, it is very difficult to use. It is part of a general exception which countries have tried to use 44 times, succeeded once, asbestos, because you have to pass five different tests. In addition, the privacy exception has another provision which says you can only use it for laws which are already consistent with the WTO rules. For example, a new rule that allows cross-border data flows in all circumstances with no privacy exceptions. So a lot of experts say this is a useless exception. And we can see that even the European Union thought that this privacy exception is not good enough to copy into the trade and services agreement, a free trade agreement. So the EU's um, DG Justice, which is responsible for the privacy laws and data protection laws in the EU, stopped the whole TISA negotiations while they figured out a better exception than this useless WTO privacy exception. Similarly, you probably saw the tweet two days ago from the European Data Protection Supervisor who said that data protection should not be subject to trade negotiations. And he was very clear because he thought that the types of exceptions in these trade agreements, these useless privacy exceptions, would not be enough and that the rules preventing data localization could water down the EU's data protection rules and open them to challenge. So he was very clear that this should not be negotiated. Nevertheless, the EU's DG Trade has proposed <laughs> cross-border data flows, restrictions on data localization and so on at the WTO. Other examples of when you might want uh, data stored locally in terms of platforms is in New Zealand, for example, they require tax records if they're stored on the cloud for that cloud to be located in New Zealand so that if the government is having a tax evasion investigation, they can actually get hold of Google's records, Facebook's records, Uber's records and see if they are doing tax evasion because otherwise you have to rely on one of these mutual legal assistance treaties, which uh, a former US prosecutor said here at the IGF are just impossible to use. You'll never get that data that you need to effectively tax the platforms. Um, and of course, there are other reasons why even developed countries require local data storage um, for financial regulation, privacy, security, and so on, which would not be allowed by these proposals in the trade agreements. The next thing I wanted to cover was you've heard a lot about the power of platforms. Um, and how they can squeeze workers who are working through platforms and so on. And I wanted to give you an example of some studies that have been done about SMEs who are trying to sell online on platforms like Amazon.com. 
already these SMEs are having to pay 40% for O of their sales on commissions to these platforms, of sales, not profits. It's a huge amount of money. And the thing is that if you want to sell online, apparently half of all on online shopping searches start on Amazon.com. So if you want to sell your umbrellas or your shirts online, you have to list them on Amazon.com. But Amazon.com, if you don't pay them enough fees, then they change the algorithm. So your umbrellas are number 1,000 in the search for umbrellas, and they delay the shipping. And so they squeeze you and squeeze you until they pay you even higher fees. And this is from a study by a US organization. Furthermore, Amazon, for example, makes their own competing products. They also manufacture umbrellas. So if you search for umbrellas on Amazon, 75% of the time, the first result in the automatic buy box is Amazon's, even if it is more expensive than the SMEs who have paid Amazon so much to list on that platform. So this is already happening to SMEs who are trying to sell on these platforms. But the proposed rules on e-commerce in trade agreements would further entrench the dominance of these platforms. For example, you probably know 30% of Amazon sales are generated by its recommendation engine. If you go online and buy some product on Amazon, they say other people also bought this, right? And then you end up buying all those things because it's a really good recommendation. They know from the data around the world that if you like this, you also like this. If it's just before Diwali in India, you probably want to buy this. They know all that, they have the data. So the cross-border data flows provisions in these trade agreements that you have to allow all this data to go out of your countries, say to Amazon, further increases the dominance of Amazon and further allows them to squeeze SMEs and so on. Similarly, if you're worried that Amazon is abusing their dominance under competition law by putting their own products first in their algorithm search, even though they're more expensive, and the competition authority wants to check this, or the antitrust regulator in the US, they want to look at the algorithm. They might want to look at the source code to see, is there really some software that always puts Amazon's results first? These proposals in the trade agreements uh, ban government regulators access to source code in all situations even fatal Toyota car crashes, even uh, high-frequency trading, but including anti-competitive conduct. So the government regulator can never figure out if these platforms are um, abusing dominance, for example, in their software. And then lastly, of course, um, as has been mentioned, physical shops are having trouble competing with online shopping platforms, and there's been various uh, studies and surveys showing how many have had to close down, um, and like 700 big box stores in the US and 22,000 Main Street businesses um, in one year alone. And it's not just the impact on the small shops, but also the tax revenue, the property taxes from these physical shops. So 55% of the tax revenue of Portland was from property taxes, 40% of this was from commercial taxes. When the local shops close down, not only jobs are lost, but the local government's tax revenue is lost. So then where do they get the revenue to pay for police or rubbish collection and so on? So just coming to an end, um, you also heard about the problems in the first presentation of underpaying people who are working uh, via platforms for gig work and so on. So if you wanted to make sure that platforms comply with labour laws, for example, that Uber pays their drivers a minimum wage, and you want to sue Uber for not paying their drivers a minimum wage, who do you sue if Uber doesn't have an office in your country? Who do you fine? Whose assets do you seize to enforce your labour laws? So um, in the WTO, in the name of e-commerce, the EU and other countries have proposed that you can't require platforms to have a local presence. You can't require them to have an office in your country that allows you to enforce your labour laws or your tax laws and so on. And <coughs> there's some possible exceptions and in free trade agreements, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, it's on a negative list basis, so only in the sectors that you list can you require a platform to have a local office. But again, what sector is Uber? Is it transport or is it computer related? We still don't know, so how do you write the relevant exceptions into your trade agreements. So there are many other ways in which the proposed trade rules make it harder to regulate platforms. We don't have time to go into it, but I'm happy to talk to anyone who's interested. But you can already see that the current and proposed trade rules, whether it's at the WTO or in a free trade agreement, can restrict your ability to regulate platforms in the types of ways that have been recommended by the earlier speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Sonia. Um, so uh, without much ado, and just by pointing out to the whole uh, significance of uh, structures of control in a platformizing society and economy, I'd like to open up uh, the floor for questions and discussions.
maybe if they registered. So Sanya is requesting that you might want to introduce yourselves and also uh, specify the name of the organization you come from. Uh, thanks. Uh, Jonathan Zook from the Innovators Network Foundation. Um, uh, this has been a lot of interesting presentations. I, I guess I'm, I find it really unfortunate that all the platforms, companies that you invited to be part of the panel all declined uh, to participate. It, it feels as though there's a somewhat of a one-sided perspective coming from the panel. And I'm, I don't have a, a dog in the fight, but I'm, I'm just uh, concerned that there's no mitigating discussion that's happening um, from the sector being discussed. I just wanted to, hi, um, uh, my name is Jovan. I'm the head of the Macedonian mission here in Geneva. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, proposals for blockchain to be uh, adapted to some of these uh, uses. So for instance, for a Airbnb or for those kinds of uh, aspects where it's not just one central corporation that is holding and then giving out, but really the owners are all of those people who have their own apartments. And then the, 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 there are nodes in, the, in a blockchain and then a consensus mechanism can develop around that. But really it's an alternative way of uh, creating uh, such a, a private entity. Um, and I would love to hear from, from anyone really two thoughts about uh, all of these aspects. But mostly the one thing that I think is uh, the key here is the aspect of uh, the fiscal aspect, the aspect of, of, of taxation because that is the way um, wealth can be redistributed if, if one goes that way. If, if wealth is being accumulated in any given way, the most effective way uh, for that to be alleviated for the, for the good of uh, most, if not all, is for, to have there to, for there to be some kind of a fiscal instrument uh, where wealth is redistributed. So those two, although related uh, thoughts, would I'd love to hear uh, comments from all. Um, thank you very much for the great panel. Uh, my name is Stefanie Milan, University of Amsterdam, and I would like to um, add something to the first question, the first com uh, person who commented. So, um, as you already pointed out, yeah, there are the, the people we are talking about, the companies we are talking about, the platforms are not here in the room. So the next question for me is, is the multi-stakeholder model we are also very much fond of here fit for the challenge? How can we, uh, you know, participate in these discussions coming from where we are at the IGF? And this also relates, of course, to the future of the IGF and its role. Thank you. We take two more questions and come back to the panel. You there. Hi, um, my name is Abby Vollmer from GitHub. Uh, I wanted to thank the panel for a really um, excellent set of issues that you've raised. Um, and to the point of platforms being in the room and responding, um, I'm very happy this came up because at GitHub we really take seriously our, I mean, I feel like saying that it sounds very trite, but Please allow me to <laughs> elaborate. I mean, we really do recognize the, the role that platforms have and the responsibilities that are being delegated to us, and we want to do it right. Um, so with respect to what Luca was bringing up about terms of service, I'm really proud to say that we involve our community in the development of our community guidelines and our terms of service. Um, so GitHub, for people who may not know it, is the world's leading software development platform, which basically means it's where most people write and share their code. Um, so we, a lot of those projects are open sourced, and so we open source the policies that govern what happens on our site. So users who go to GitHub to write and share code and whatever else they might do that's sort of code-like. I'm a lawyer and we use it for legal, we, everybody GitHub uses GitHub for everything, but <laughs> for whatever you're using it for, to know what those standards are that are governing the use of their website is not only crucial, but being involved in the development of them, we find is also really crucial, and it contributes to legitimacy of the platform. Um, so not only <laughs> trying to tout and say how proud I am of this, I wanna also put that standard out there for other companies as a best practice, and by open sourcing it, we, we have it out there for other people to use and adopt as they see fit. Um, so I'm happy to talk um, to anybody in further detail, but just wanted to kind of highlight that there are some positive examples out there, and um, hopefully we can work with civil society to um, to highlight those examples where where we can get more momentum behind it and make that become the industry standard. Thank you. 
Uh, it's just a short question. Uh, I'm Pedro from Institute for Research on Internet and Society from Brazil. Um, most of the discussions on uh, platform liability and platform responsibility so far have been concerning uh, the form of Western apps that are super specialized on specific things like social, transportation, Airbnb. But we see a trend, uh, especially in China, that may come to the West as well and the rest of the world of super apps that just uh, get all those functions together. So if you had a problem uh, differentiation between Airbnb being an information service or a housing service, now it would be even more complicated because the same app would be all of them. Do you believe the same problems will remain or we will face a completely different challenge and how it would change if it does? Uh, well, for I, th took I would like to make two comments. One on the uh, on the lady from GitHub uh, that uh, actually I th I'm really happy to hear that there is some democratic platform regulator. <laughs> I mean, the fact that I, my observation is uh, a very objective observation on the role that platforms are playing. Then, as any regulator, you may have a very participatory, open, and democratic regulator, as GitHub seems to be. Uh, but you can also have an interested and biased regulator. So the, the important thing for me is that we, we recognize things with their name. Then we can work together to make them look like GitHub or uh, be victim of what will happen. But at least we have a starting point where we understand how things work and we all agree on this. Uh, the, the comment on the, the emergence, I, don't, I wouldn't say that there is a tendency on super app. There is one super app that is WeChat that has everything. <laughs> But honestly, yesterday I was in a panel on cyber bricks uh, that I organized, and even the Chinese representative was uh, sharing fear of monopoly, and he didn't directly mention WeChat, but it was qu quite easy to understand that he, th this was the super app, the, mono the monopolist app he was referring to. I don't see other super app, and honestly, I, unless uh, very big apps that already exist, uh, that have already the user base necessary then to turn the, uh, the regular app in a super app as WeChat did, that at the very beginning was a social network and then added a plethora of functionality becoming a super app. So unless very few dominant applications already exist, decide to turn their application into a super app, uh, it's very, very difficult to have to other super apps emerging. Because to have a super app, you, have, you need a super customer base, a super user base and it's something that you have to build before having the super app. Uh, it's very tricky to make pl uh, platform users move from their platform to another platform, particularly when platform are designed, you know, it, another thing that uh, I didn't mention because you have, we have time, time constraint is the importance of be behavioral design. Platform are designed to make us stay on the platform and don't leave the platform and all those nice notifications are, it's, it's what psychologists call uh, variable rewards. When you don't know what will happen, it's like the slot machine. When you don't know what will be the result, you're extremely intrigued and almost addicted to what you are doing. And so you keep on uh, checking your Facebook account, your, uh, your Twitter account. Just check, just imagine what is the, your favorite app that you check when you wake up. That is a symptom of addiction. The first thing that you do in the morning, if you smoke a cigarette or if you check this, this specific app, it means that you are addicted to that product, right? So that, this is not a coincidence. I mean, there is even a, a, a summit in Silicon Valley called the, 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 behavior, the Behavior Summit, where people discuss how to make more addictive products. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, again, I'm, I, I'm, it, the, 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 if you know that you are using an addictive product and you want to use it as being a smoker, you are absolutely free to do it. What you are not free to do it, I think, is to sell a highly addictive product, to manipulate people, to collect their data, and to use them ad eternum without telling them. It is manipulation. It is not uh, regular business practices, right? So again, we, if we, we, if we, we can all agree that this kind of, of, of pattern is the best possible ever, but we have to know it. And I don't see a lot of information about this. We have just now uh, receiving the first study about the impact, the psychological impact that platform may have on users. And I think we need more discussion also on this, the fact that these products are not only so successful because they are very good, they are so successful because they are highly addictive. 
Yeah, I'd like to comment on the question on blockchain. I think that's that's really um, interesting to, to think about. And um, I think for the technology itself on blockchain, again, it'll depend on how it develops. So as you know, there's a lot of interest and a lot of business models being developed around it. So people are looking and lots of startups on how to make money behind blockchain. So I think in principle, using blockchain, yes, can eliminate more intermediaries that for the users and those that are involved in transactions through blockchain can be very useful. Um, but again, the concern will be what's the business model behind and then those that are making available um, that business in the business context, you know, again, what will be the same kind of rules that we'll have to adapt as being customers under under these that are being provided. But I think this is this is will be the next area that IGC, IGF, or probably I just haven't been following in detail. I will need to look more detail. Uh, just on the tax question, yeah. Um, as I mentioned, the e-commerce proposals uh, in these trade agreements include that you can't require tax records to be stored locally. So if you want to investigate whether there has been tax evasion, how do you get the records? You have to request them from another country and it takes a lot of time and effort. But in addition to this, uh, depending on your tax law, I'm not sure in Macedonia, if you can't require a platform like uh, Amazon or Uber or Airbnb to have a local office in your country, it might restrict your ability to get jurisdiction to tax them because they don't have an entity in your country, so how do you tax them even though they're making profits in your country from your consumers and your citizens? And the third way that um, I've noticed that tax can be affected by these e-commerce proposals in trade agreements is that um, some tax authorities, such as in the US, require access to the source code, the software. Um, and this is, for example, in the accounting or tax return software that companies use or that people use. Um, if they can't reasonably ascertain the correctness of the item on the tax return in any other way, the US tax authorities have the power to inspect the source code of the tax preparation software, to take it away, to share it with certain experts and so on. And this would be prohibited under the EU and Japanese proposals at the WTO. Um, and it's not clear if there would be sufficient tax exceptions there or in other free trade agreements. So I didn't do tax law in my law degree, but uh, these are some of the ways I've already noticed from talking to tax experts that e-commerce proposals can affect your ability to effectively tax uh, platforms and even other companies. <coughs> So just another observation, uh, because I think there is an element that we uh, also have to consider. So the, the as I was saying before, uh, data, personal data particularly, are the most valuable resource, right? We keep on hearing it, the new oil, uh, the most valuable resource, uh, repeating it again and again. Why? Because it is true. Uh, so uh, together with other people, and uh, there is also some of them here in the room, we, have, uh, we are promoting an, a different approach, which is the my data approach. Uh, which is, ba it, it is based not on having the platform storing all your data uh, and keeping them forever, but it's, it is ha based on having a my data custodian. It's a sort of data bank. Imag just imagine a bank, a regular bank. Your most valuable resource maybe is your money. So you put your money in a bank, then the bank can use it to make investment, but if you want to withdraw your money and go to another bank with better conditions, you are free to do it whatever you want. That is not like that with data, which is even more ma valuable than money sometimes. So you store your data in the platform, you leave it there forever, period. You cannot uh, withdraw your, your data and go to another uh, data provider that offers you better conditions. So the my data try to approach, try to revert this logic from a platform-centered uh, uh, model to an individual-centered model, where you define uh, what, who is the, the my data custodian that can keep your data. They are open and interoperable. So you can define, you can say, perfectly say, I want Facebook to use my data, and Facebook will, you, you will use your data to whatever uh, purpose you define is acceptable. Uh, but you will not, but you will not have Facebook do whatever. I, I don't want to, uh, to to victimize or to uh, speak only about Facebook. But let's imagine whatever platform you want. So the current system is that they collect your data and they have them forever. Uh, the my data approach is based on having my data custodian that will keep your data in an open interoperable format and you will define how the data will be used. There is already some good example of it here in Switzerland, by the way. Uh, if you check on, on the inter on, on internet, my data is called, is spelled M-E uh, data dot cop. It's a cooperative, a Swiss cooperative that allows you to define how your medical data will be used and by whom for research, for other purposes, and the people are in, in, in power of how their data are used, and the My Data Custodian is keeping them. 
in if they decide that another custodian has better conditions or protecting them better because the actual one is not protecting them uh, in the right way, they can move them because they are open and interoperable. So there are, there are also other juridical and technical tools that we may consider. Sorry, I forgot to answer the question about WeChat uh, and generally some of the platforms that are going across so many sectors. And it is difficult. I mean, in trade law, we have to know what service sector something belongs to to figure out whether we have opened it to foreign companies or not and how we can regulate it and so on. And this is common in the WTO or in free trade agreements. So I don't know if WeChat is a computer-related service or a financial service. I don't know if Amazon is a retail service or a transport service or a computer-related service or a logistics service. So it's very hard to tell um, whether we have already liberalized these in each of our countries. Uh, if we have liberalized them, how we can regulate them and so on, because in the WTO, for example, they are negotiating new rules on um, how you can regulate services that would probably apply to the service sectors that you've liberalized at the WTO, but how do you know if you've liberalized that platform when it goes across so many things? Um, and the other thing that I forgot to mention was that um, there's been a lot of talk about how e-commerce can help small and medium enterprises, um, but when you look at the actual proposed e-commerce rules at the WTO, as I mentioned, they can be used to squeeze small and medium enterprises and increase the power of the platforms. So in fact, last week at the WTO Ministerial Conference, um, associations of SMEs from African countries, Latin America, Asia and so on, representing millions of SMEs, said we don't want these proposed WTO e-commerce rules. They will harm us. Don't do it in our name because they are actually going to further um, squeeze us and help the platforms, for example. Thank you. Hi, my name is Peter Sheehan. I'm from the University of Cambridge. Um, I want to pick up on a couple things that have been touched on in the panel and in the audience. The blockchain idea is quite interesting, but um, I, I, I'm interested more in sort of the medium to long, medium term, the thought that blockchain may sort of become more useful comp competition may see this sort of empower individuals and decrease the power of intermediaries in the long term, but in the short term, intermediaries still remain very relevant. And so I appreciated Luca's sort of development of this idea of the, the my data approach of how can we think about actually empowering end users uh, over intermediaries in the, the short term. And I just wanted to raise sort of another idea that I've been talking with a colleague about, and that is the idea of a data-driven union, in essence. So we can think of a data bank for maybe an analog of a Facebook or a social media website, but what about these micro-working platforms or what about ride-sharing, ride-hailing applications? If you could imagine a scenario in which these companies would be mandated to share information with a union, suddenly we would have data on how working conditions were in the aggregate. This data could be used either to apply current labor law or to empower the union to then lobby government with effective data on how bad the conditions are. I'm interested to hear anyone's thoughts on the matter. Thanks. Well, thank you. I'm Parminder from IT for Change. Uh, I greatly liked uh, all the four presentations. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, having described the structures of power very well, uh, we are now interested in seeking what to do about it. So the challenges are both at the national level and the, at the international level. At the national level, the challenge is whether we seek individual responses, a uh, very individualized kind of a response to this huge structure of power, or we seek collectivist uh, responses, or if both, what are the proportions between the two. Luca talked about a more individualized response, which has become relatively more common. It's collectivized, but individual takes the initiative to do it. Uh, we are looking at more collectivist responses, for example, even a state-based response. India has, for example, developed some digital and data infrastructures. We know the problem which state, getting state into the data systems uh, brings along, but I think there are different political economy questions. But the question about how much regulation and state-based responses and how much still market and individuals getting together uh, would work, because especially in developing countries where the resources and skills are low, uh, it's very difficult for people to even do those kind of my bank kind of initiatives. It requ requires a lot of initiative and 
uh, capabilities to do that, and whether uh, if we can have you know well institutionalized systems which are state based but institutionalized from executives etc to do that. And as I said, India is doing some work on that. I think EU also has some policies on which uh, the the state works on such defenses on data around health and transportation, especially there are initiatives in EU and uh, in some other areas in India. And secondly, we all know that most of these platforms are global. So what is the role of international law or international policies uh, to, to look at this? Because unless we have uh, interoperable policy systems globally and some common norms, uh, it's going to be very difficult even for global business to survive. Uh, so what is the role of the international law? And sorry, because the panel did not answer the question about why there is no representative of the, the platforms on the panel. I'm sure uh, the organizers would have uh, tried to find it. Uh, find one, but it happens when the structure of power is huge and well established as the big internet companies and platforms are that people discuss that structure of power often even in absence of a representative of that structure of power. We do it all the time with governments. I have seen many rooms which are discussing about government abuse of power without a government uh, uh, guy on the platform and the corporates today the kind we are talking about exercise similar kind of structures of power and I don't think there's a big problem on discussing it without having a Google or Facebook on the platform. And also it's very interesting, you know, coming for, from an older policy uh, norms uh, rather than a multi-stakeholder norm, there was a time when if a policy discussion is going on, uh, people will ask, has anyone a private interest in this policy discussion? And a person would walk out of the room if somebody had a private interest in that policy discussion. Uh, and I think that was also exalted democratic norm, uh, which now seems to be inversed and said you cannot have a discussion have, unless you have a big role of that private interest in that policy discussion. So I think this balance of perspectives have to be kept in mind. Thank you. Uh, it was interesting what you were suggesting about the uh, data sharing you know, for, for labor and so on, uh, because I was happening to see that under the Obama administration, the US government's uh, Federal Trade Commission actually forced data brokers, nine data brokers, to give them information about data collection and data use practices so they could actually see what they were doing. And then they wrote a thick report about it, and they could tell us things like one data broker has 3,000 data segments for nearly every US customer. And we only know that because the US government forced the data brokers to tell them what they were doing and then they published a report about it. So there is already some precedent in this area and then I guess depending on your domestic laws whether it's actually feasible to force this kind of data production uh, either to figure out what's going on or to regulate or to enforce laws and so on. Just a comment on, uh, because I know that uh, it's, I, I provided a lot of food for thought so uh, it's, I just wanted to clarify uh, a, a, with a comment on what you, Parminder, were saying about the, inter the individualized approach. I would not consider my data as an individualized approach because it simply put the individual at the center because he, can, he or she can uh, take decision on how the data are utilized. But the role of the custodian could be perfectly undertaken by any kind of business. If you had government mandating the use of my data as a policy, as a standard policy, meaning that every individual has to be, has the, the, the right to have his data collected by a selected, a, a custodian of his choice that will provide to this individual the condition. There are already a lot of businesses that could do it. Imagine, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't want to give any absurd suggestion, but banks or telecom operator or postal services, they already have all the capabilities. I'm just mentioning some businesses that could have the capability to, to uh, collect data to, and to use them and to give access to data in an interoperable fashion only to those who are allowed by the data subject. And if they were not doing their work, their job properly, as data are collected and stored in an, inter in an open and interoperable, fa in an interoperable fashion, the data subject, the individual, could at any moment change custodian. So you, you have a great amount of competition amongst who gives the best condition, the best protection to the user. So it is not really individual. It's a quite multi-stakeholder approach, if you want. If you, I mean, now it's, very, it's really at the early stages. But if enough people are aware of the, of the existence and try to lobby for it, lobby in a positive way, lo meaning presenting the benefits 
and asking for policies that are favorable in this, in this uh, direction. I think that this could be a very sustainable and also very good for business because you would have data custodians that are local, not global enterprise localized somewhere else. Sorry. Or, or even global enterprise somewhere, somewhere else if they have better conditions for you. Yeah, so I, um, you know, I know I'm butting in and there are panelists uh, who are better positioned perhaps to talk about this, but I want to come back to um, my colleague who asked the question about what's the role of multi-stakeholderism in this debate on platforms when you're actually seeing this kind of unprecedented power uh, with certain corporations, you know, uh, I'm just using my license to reinterpret your question. Um, I think I'd like to uh, ask the question as a sub-question to something that's a bigger question. The, that question is, what is the role of public interest uh, or policies related to public interest in the platform economy? I think that's the, the first question for me, and therefore the next question for me would be then, where is the social contract going, you know? Because what we've seen effectively today through all the presentations is that there is an absolute breakdown of social contract. You know, there's, you know, you're actually seeing a formalization of certain sectors of the economy, but they're all gig. So to that extent, even in the formal economy, these workers don't have rights. And you, you're actually seeing in Mark's research in Nigeria that the wages are actually spiraling downward. <coughs> so what you're actually seeing is that Worker interest, public interest, user interest, consumer interest, and citizen interest, they're all at, uh, are being held at ransom. So if they're being held hostage, then the question to ask in relation to platforms is, what is it that, we, that needs to be done through public policy at the global and national level for public interest and for the social contract? Once you ask that question, indeed, there is a place for multi-stakeholder involvement because that multi-stakeholder methodology will have to follow the compass, which is about public interest and the social contract. So uh, the public interest and social contract include ideas of competition, ideas of level playing field, ideas of uh, a private interest, indeed, of innovation and such. I'd also like to point out in the case of the GitHub uh, discussion with Lu between Luca and yourself, that I think that it's possible to put certain things within the ambit of a private contract. So uh, if you look at um, uh, digital transactions and in the digital economy, it's possible to say that you, know, you can actually develop and build code and build co do that in an open way and then terms of uh, services can be transparent and not opaque and you can actually inform users how this is. And that can be a good practice scenario. Now let's take a completely different kind of a scenario where the user is not involved what is under stake is the life of a person who's not even connected. And I'm referring, for instance, to one of the small and medium enterprises in, the, in, in India. And uh, the, just to go by statistics, 5% of SMEs in the Indian context are connected. Uh, they have the internet and they're not online. Uh, the rest are not online. So 95% is not online. Now in the platform economy, what do you do? I mean, they're not even anywhere close to any terms of service, but the entire platformization of the economy is having a direct impact that Sanya's research study showed, shows, shows us about how they will either shut shop or will survive. Now, what's the role for public policy in the context of this kind of a, a complete retail supply chain getting re-engineered? You know, can we go with private contracts alone? Of course, there is a role for private contracts, which I want to reassert again. But what happens, again, going by your example, of a persuasive economy? You know, people have, uh, psychologists are talking about per persuasion e economics with, and persuasion politics. You know, we all know about how elections are rigged, and we know about how we are all going to be joining this endless, uh, uh, you know, quest for consumption through the persuasion e economy. So how do you, at a larger public interest level of wanting to or not wanting to be part of this, you know, if we all want to be consumers uh, in capitalism, so be it, but we also want to be citizens and non-consumers in different parts of our life, then we really need a framework which doesn't uh, exist. So I'd like to also think a, a little bit about the public and social value of data, which 
uh, may be important for public authorities or a custodian like the telecom regulatory authority who is uh, independent of the executive and who has, like the information commissioner uh, or the data commissioner, who can audit algorithms, who can actually decide that this is actually an, an anti-competitive practice or who can decide that this data you know, collected by Uber has public value or this data collected, personal data collected by Facebook has value to govern my municipality or my village, et cetera. So unless you actually also start thinking about cooperative or communitarian or public value-based uh, models for data, we will constantly end up uh, uh, re-emphasizing that which we seek to critique. By which I mean that if we have a certain critique of not wanting to end up as a, a data bit, you know, in, in the big machinery of global capitalism, we'll, by reinforcing a private contract, we'll precisely be doing that. That, you know, we might have the right to shop between custodians, but whether our lives collectively or the, the life of a small and medium enterprise will get better is a moot point. Now we're getting somewhere. Um, let me try to kind of um, tie my thoughts with what you just kind of put there on, on, on uh, uh, for us to, to think about, and as well as uh, what um, uh, the, the colleague from, from uh, University of Cambridge mentioned. And uh, it's, a, it, I, it's actually a, a thought that um, uh, I, I've been discussing with some friends quite a, bit, quite a while ago. I've been involved in internet governance issues since 2003, th since WISIS, and we were discussing exactly this, of how data at one point becomes uh, a political uh, aspect, a political tool, and how perhaps what unionization did in terms of protecting worker rights, um, you know, several decades ago, might be the approach to um, a, this, a response to how citizens uh, take responsibility over their data in a collective manner, and this is exactly what also what Luca was saying that you know it's an individual right, but it's protected by a collective, um, and it has to be approached in that way where we collectively say um, we we would give you the right to use our data under these conditions, but any one individual cannot do that. You have to be a part of somewhere a collective that collectively says we all agree that our individual rights have to be protected in in this way, and for that um, you know. I say that I've been involved in this discussion for a while be to emphasize one thing. I've been involved in, in a, as a government representative, as private sector, and as civil society in different uh, iterations of it. And I'm really disturbed, to be honest, even uh, at the opening uh, ceremony, the formal part of it, that again, almost every IGF, government is put as the boogeyman. And it's a very dangerous trend that that, that, that is so. It's always that, you know, we, we want some predictability, but we don't want any regulations, and governments are bad. Governments should not get into the, into the internet. Governments should not be involved into this. Yes, there is some sense to that, and there is a reason behind that, because perhaps some governments have abused domestically their, uh, the aspects of governments, but not all of them have, that, have done that. Governments are necessary to empower these kinds of discussions. Governments are necessary to protect rights, because all of these rights that we're talking about have to be somehow put into a climate of legality. And that climate of legality needs jurisdiction. And that jurisdiction is the only way you can protect these rights. So I mean, we cannot be talking in any way, in any abstract form about this. The entity of statehood is necessary. It's currently, the, the aspect of governance is the, the, is the state. It could be a different one. It has been historically different ones. But currently, it is that. So it, that entity has to be used to protect the rights that we're talking about. Otherwise, there's no, there are other ways, there's revolutionary ways of doing it, uh, you know, that it's always been historically an option, but the calm, the regulated, the good form of protecting rights is within the boundaries of a national jurisdictions, or some kind of jurisdictions. It has to be, it doesn't have to be by borders, but jurisdictions nonetheless. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, just, I would like to reformulate that in my thoughts by saying, I think all governments have abused their powers sometimes. Rather than saying some governments are bad and many others are good, I'd like to say that all governments have state power in their hands and you know it's, it's for use or abuse. 
And uh, the latest Civicus report actually says that only 3% of the world's population lives in a place where civil society lives in a place where their rights are not repressed. So that leaves the 97% uh, with a potential for their rights to be threatened. Any last thoughts from our panelists? Davina? You okay. I like to talk, I like to speak a lot, as you may have understood. So my my, my last talk thought is that I mean to to, to complement what uh, the gentleman from Macedonia was saying uh, that when when we are when we ex when we treat the government as the boogeyman, uh, well, it means that the only subject that can really protect us are the boogeyman, and we don't trust them. Uh, so here is to, to make to also complement what Stefania was saying. Here is where the multi-stakeholder model comes as, as useful because if you have uh, different people providing different opinions and supporting their claim with data, then you can have a very informed conversation and you can request government to adopt policies that are in the public interest because you can understand what is the public interest and you can ask them to implement what is objectively the public interest. Uh, now, if, if we keep on saying that government, I mean, some government are, have been behaving as the boogeyman and that is the reason why many people say that they are the boogeyman. But if you have objective data on which you can uh, have an informed debate and take decision, well, it's much less easy to be the boogeyman without being considered objectively the boogeyman. Whereas on the other hand, if you take your, your decision because there are specific data that tell you this is the right decision, you cannot say that the government is the boogeyman. The government is the one that is taking the right decision to protect you. So I, I would uh, urge to have a multi-stakeholder debate to inform how efficient policy can be taken. Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, this was a lot of food for thought. And I really hope that this galvanizes many more debates in the forthcoming IGFs. Thank you. It's a choice for the delay, but I, I have to speak now. Because actually, I'm going to speak at the end. So, yeah. the information already, and this is your opportunity. Thank you very much.